One of the biggest reasons why I really like bowling from my own competitive perspective is the fact that it is really just me versus 10 pins and 60 feet of lane. Most of the time who you're bowling against doesn't matter as long as you position yourself right into the right events without overextending yourself. But really it's just you versus pins. It's you versus the lane. It's not you versus that other person, even in match play. That also makes practice really important because if you want to compete at a high level, you have to put in the time to get to that level so that you can be your best self versus somebody else who is their best self. But even still, it's most of the time not you versus them. It's just you versus yourself. Execute your shots, make your spares, and you're going to do pretty well. But the physical game is only one piece to this puzzle. There's also the mental game. There's also a bit of luck involved. And when you don't have all three of those pieces matching up together, sometimes getting the results that you want can be more difficult to acquire. It doesn't mean that you're not good. It doesn't mean that you're not putting in the effort. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to win at some point. But sometimes you're just in the middle of that process. Ashley Galante has been on the women's tour since its re-inception in 2015. She's a former teen masters champion. She's a former high average holder for multiple years as a youth female bowler. And she's also in the middle of the struggle of trying to get to title number one. Ashley was generous enough to share some of her time to tell her story and also give us some insights on kind of what she's been working on with her game and how she's really pushing to get title number one. So let's get to it. 10 Pin Life podcast number two with Ashley Galante. you've been able to grow your brand. And because of that, I think the sport has grown when you're on TV. You know, we talk about the Empress stuff here as well, which I'm super curious how that experience was, but also kind of want to know what you're working on as well. And like, you know, what, what projects do you have going on in bowling? I know you just won on Saturday, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, I guess, uh, to start off with, um, we can kind of roll all the way back. Um, you were, and still are one of the most successful youth bowlers to have ever lived <laughs> um, with having a high average. That, like amazing youth career and then feel so unsuccessful as an adult. <laughs> I wouldn't say unsuccessful. I think you're just, I think they're, you're, you're in this transitionary or transition period um, and you have been for a bit and I, 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 I just want to caution the, the idea that you're unsuccessful. I would, I would disagree. Um, but let's talk, let's just, let's go back. Right. So okay. you were, you were national high average for female youth bowlers for like six years in a row. Um, team masters runner up one year, and then you won it the next year, if I remember right. And that was the train station days, which is so cool. <laughs> Um, what got you into bowling? Um, and then what kind of propelled you to be like one of the best in the nation during those years? <sighs> Let's see. My dad said I had to do a sport. So I had done gymnastics, ballet, figure skating, and I didn't like any of it. And my dad was the, one of those parents, which I agree with, is that when you start something, you have to finish it. So like, as much as I hated figure skating, I remember I had to finish all the classes before I could start something new. Mm -hmm. So uh, then he gave me a choice. He's like, I really want you to do golf, but I'm going to give you a choice between bowling and golf. And he was a bowler at the time, so he was, like, talking to, like, local people trying to find, like, a uh, just, like, a coach. Mm -hmm. um, and me being 12, I was like, well, yeah, I was, probably, I was probably a bit lazy back then, too, like, couch potato, like, didn't like being outside very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I wanted to do bowling because it was indoors. I didn't want to be outside in the heat. Mm -hmm. Now, if I was hmm, if I was able to go back in time, I'd probably tell myself to do golf. There's money in golf. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I don't regret my decision at all. Um, I, I think that it took me a little while to um, actually – get into bowling because I was very, um, I was very sick as a child. So I wasn't around a lot of people. So just, I was very introverted mm -hmm. and even to be with my coach, I didn't want to be around him. I didn't want to talk to him, especially because I was a male coach. I wanted a female coach. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just didn't work out that way. Um, so what ha ended up happening was, is that my dad was like, well, let's just try this out. And he put me into a league and I hated the idea of my dad spending money on me, if that makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. I was like, how, how much does this cost you, dad? I, I don't want you spending the money, you mm -hmm. know? 
Um, and uh, and it was like that for quite a bit. And then we started bowling. He, we practiced at home. We did all of my steps at home. And uh, I guess generally I just started loving it once I started really getting into it. And um, I think I was just naturally good at it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure if it was because I was naturally good at it or because before my coach would start working with me. He made me go home and practice my steps at home. Mm-hmm. So I would go through my four step approach at home and I did 20 steps a night for like two weeks. And then when I got a ball in my hand, uh, I actually already had the footwork. I already had everything working for me. Mm-hmm. So then mm-hmm. from there, you know, and then I'll, you know, just from there it was like, it wasn't as difficult, I guess. Yeah. Um, so you started bowling at 12. I think it was, it was 11 or 12. Yeah. It's, yep. so, it's around that range. It, it's so hard. <laughs> it was a while ago. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> it's, but it's it's interesting to because most of the the people that you see well not maybe not most I guess I don't know everyone's story but it's probably more common to have people start especially at the the that high level that you're at whether like so many of their parents were proprietors and they started bowling as soon as they could walk or yeah. you know like you've got these kids that um you know I I talked with Maria Bolanova. Uh, last week and she started in when she was like seven um, and it's just it's just the sport that I grew up playing and for you it's a little bit different and then in a very short amount of time you know between that 12 to or 11 to 14 stage you went from I've never really done this before to I'm going to work as hard as I can on something to being like nationally recognized in and then to do that in a three-year period is kind of ridiculous like it's in in a very good way um like was that something where like you said you don't you know you you were taught you don't quit on something like that but what was the thing not, not everyone can have their parents propel them to being nationally great and I would say that it's probably pretty rare to have that happen but what was what was the practice process like? Was it was it mostly like at homework? Did it did it encapsulate your entire mind when you were at school, or was it just something that it was like, I just really like it and I just want to do this? Um, I will say that it wasn't forced on me because yeah. once I once I got to the point where I was like, I want to do this, and I like I like I love it. Uh, I loved practicing, and I think even to this day, I really do enjoy practicing. Um, I just love being on the lanes. Uh, I think my favorite is when nobody's in the center and it's just like just me in the lanes. Mm-hmm. Like it just has this nice little, I, I don't know, it's it's my release, mm-hmm. I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, something for me to focus on and, and have something to drive towards. Mm-hmm. Um, but bowling captured my mind in every way possible. Um, let's see. It starts with me always practicing at home. Like mm-hmm. didn't miss practices at home. Uh, I practice four to six hours a day on the lane. Okay. Uh, <laughs> That's a lot. Will, yeah. Uh, and it wasn't like going out there and bowling, like uh, just throwing strike balls and trying to pull high games. Like mm-hmm. it was me working on either things that my coach, like my goal every week was that every time I see my coach, I want him to be like, wow, you got this down already? Okay, guess what? We get to work on something. I always looked for that, that excitement from him. So I worked really hard. So that, like, I can get that from him every single week. Mm-hmm. Um, so then when it came to, like, me developing my own practices, like, things that people wouldn't do would be, like, practicing their 10 pins or their 7 pins and their spare shooting. And I'd spend games just shooting spares. Um, I would practice different target lines. I would play up the gutter. I'd play deep. And then, I like, I'd make these own little games for myself where what's the highest score I could play? while playing the gutter on one lane and then deep on the other lane. Mm-hmm. And when I started shooting like 200s doing that, um, I would start doing it with maybe different releases. Or I remember one time I put in like I had, let's say like four or five different bowling balls. And I put up four or five different games and every bowling, I had to like line up with each bowling ball mm-hmm. and see which ball was going to get the highest game. Mm-hmm. And honestly, out of anything, that was probably the most challenging thing that I did. Mm-hmm. But then you know, then you have practices with release, and then you have just like I just practice every part of the game to make myself as much as versatile as I could. Because mm-hmm. you know, especially back then, more so than I think even now, is that the game was even different. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's evolved now differently than it was back then, and being versatile was very important. Mm-hmm. In my, I mean, it still is, 
but a lot of I feel like now because of between how um, the equipment is advanced and uh, just being able to drill bowling balls like that, you know, it, it kind of just takes a little bit of that versatility out. Not that you don't need it, you still do, but um, it's probably not as crucial as it used to be. If yeah. That's fair it, to oh yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Um, which it, it, I, I want to go one direction, but I want to focus on the versatility side and get into the teen masters thing, because that competition since its inception has been all about versatility and being able to play where the lanes tell you to play. Now I never participated in it, but I have watched a ton of it and I understand it pretty deeply and I really appreciate it. So tell me about that process of, you know, because you had probably had to play everywhere on the lanes to be even be minorly successful, let alone win it. Um, what was that like? I mean, that's that's pretty awesome to have gone from I didn't bowl to <laughs> Teen Masters champ in five years. Yeah, it was. Um, it was something that I loved. I loved because that was something that like I already practiced. I already practiced play on one one ball, one lane, one or the other, and all of a sudden now they have a tournament that's like them. I'm like, well, great, I could do that. Mm-hmm. I already do this all the time, anyways. Um, but truthfully, the first year that, uh, when I came in second at team masters, mm-hmm. I think, I believe both years I led the tournament by 200 pounds. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and that's not an over exaggeration. I'm pretty sure that's what the numbers were. Yeah. Um, but before bowling team masters, um, I had a really bad outing at junior gold. Okay. And I remember I just had this phone call with my coach and I was just like, I'm done. I can't handle this. Like, cause I, you have to understand, I am so competitive. And so like dealing with that pain of like losing was very, very hard to deal with. And I, I was like, I'm, I'm already committed. I'm bowling this tournament. I'm here, but I, I don't even care about it. I was like, oh, whatever. I'm going to bowl it. And then I'm quitting bowling after this. I'm done. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to bowl anymore. And then yeah, obviously I go out there now, like you just swings relax because you're like, I don't care. I'm not, I'm done with bowling after this. Mm-hmm, <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. Then you start leading it. Now I'm on national TV and now I'm doing all these things. I'm like, I guess I'm not quitting now. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting how um, poetic that can be, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting how poetic bowling can be like that, where it's as soon as you don't care. Like, how many times have you bowled in just like a local tournament or something small, and you're shut out in the semifinal, and you absolutely peer your last four shots, to, and you lose by like three when you just had a 30-pin deficit? And it's like, as soon as your brain is like, this isn't a big deal, it's just just bowling, they all fall down again. <laughs> well, truthfully, I had the when I made the year that I made Team USA, it was the same thing. I was like, I don't care, you know. Mm-hmm. Like I had that I don't care attitude, mm-hmm. and which it, it's weird because I feel like that's such a bad attitude to have. But at the same time, for me, um, I think because I put so much pressure and so much stress on myself that it, it would actually just gave me the freedom to bowl, mm-hmm. like just be me. Um, so, yeah, that, it was just kind of funny because most of my successes were, okay, I'm done with this. I'm mm-hmm. not quitting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I always have those minor threats. Like, I, I can't tell you how many times, even though over these past years of the, on the PWA tour, I'm done. I'm quitting. I'm, I'm done with this. I can't deal with this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's talk let's talk about that a little bit. Um, so you've been on the PWBA tour since it relaunched, right? Yes. And we're still waiting on title number one. You've got a regional win, um, which was 2016, if my memory serves me right. Um, what's the uh, what was something that has surprised you um, since the tour relaunched? And um, like, what what has been the thing that's kind of been like you expected it to be one way, and now it's substantially different than maybe what your expectations were when you when you started back on tour. Hmm. I guess the thing is, is that from year to year, the things that I feel like I need to work on and get better at the following year, it's the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. Like, um, if we go back to like, I think it was 2019, I felt like everything that we did, every, all of our angles were like up the lane and you had to like really keep it in front of you. 
Where this year is complete opposite. Like our, you not only did you have to get it that way, but you had to get it that way like early. Like it wasn't like okay that way. It was like this way. Yeah. <laughs> so it was just like okay. Well, I'm glad I got really good at doing this. Now I gotta do that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, and I mean it's just a constant. It's a constant growing process. It's yeah. Constant. You know, just getting comfortable with doing things that you're not super comfortable with, and coming home and practicing and saying, you know, I gotta be better at this. I mean. I'm good enough to do it to where I'm an, like an average bowler, like 200. Like mm. most, I mean, very rare. I mean, like I had one, besides the U.S. Open, I had one really bad tournament. But mm. other than that, uh, and I don't even really consider U.S. Open. Like I, I look back at that and I'm like, it's hard for me to really be upset. I mean, I'm upset because it was the U.S. Open. Yeah. But when I go back and I think about my performance, I, I'm not upset with myself and my performance. Um, it was just, it's just, it was a struggle. I mean, it was a struggle to carry it. You know, everybody yeah. had splits. Everybody had, um, you know, difficulties. It was just that I couldn't put any strikes together. It would right. be like strike temp and strike temp and strike pockets at a ten. Right. You know, so instead of saving games that you normally would, I w- it wasn't happening. So mm-hmm. now it was, and you weren't going to have those huge games to really help bring you back up. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I did feel like I hit the pocket a bunch and did not carry. But anyways, uh, going back to my season, I just feel like that I need to – I feel like I'm good at being in that that minus 20, yeah. plus 20 range, something around that, around like the 190, 200 average. Mm-hmm. And I think that I really need to get better at overall just being better at those lines. Yeah. And ball reaction, obviously. Um, do, you, do you prefer a grind fest – over a strike vest? Uh, generally, yeah. Yeah. I think so. Because that's more me. I know I do. Like, I cannot stand house shot tournaments. I don't know where your mind is at on that. But, you know, I see yeah. I see a tournament. Now, I think we can – not that the U.S. Open has no value in understanding that that is the grind fest, right? But that's yeah. such an anomaly that it was so – damn hard like I didn't bowl on any of it and I saw those four patterns and I was like well those are impossible like the (laughs) like the first one was playable ish it appeared and then and then you go to 40 foot flat which everyone knows is hard um but it seemed like some shape developed in it late but it's like then it's like is eight games enough with those lane panels being brand new and we can have a whole discussion about that. <laughs> um, and then you get into that third pattern, which is all forward oil. And I'm like, that's impossible. Like I know somebody is going to absolutely bash this pattern, um, which Sherry ended up doing, but you know, she rolls it so much differently. She's on the left side, whatever. And then the fourth Thank pattern you. was like, the fourth pattern was the hardest out of them all. Like it, the, the second got all the credit for being flat, but that, that taper that went backwards at the end of that fourth pattern, I was like, every the, that is going to ruin people's days. But that's the grind. Now, yeah. when I'm bowling tournaments, all I I don't want to strike fest because I'm not going to keep up. Like I have a really hard time putting together eight baggers. However, let's shoot clean games and let me put in a double and a three bagger and put up a 213 to put up a 220 and I'm going to do that 10 times because guess what that other guy he's not going to be able to do it 10 times he's going to have two blow up games so he might have a 240 but he's also going to have a buck 60 mixed in there and I'm going to end up ahead um but and I think like the ladies tour to go back to your point about how it's changed um it's that's something else that I think I've seen is there are some tournaments that are absolute, like you have to outstrike people, maybe not world series of bowling level. Um, and then some of them that are just, uh, Sonoma count or Sonoma Valley. Um, the, went the couple years where they did the 37 foot flat back to back, like total grinders. Um, you said you kind of prefer the grind fest, but like, when you walk into a tournament, do you guys know what you're going to be bowling on? And like, what's the process of like, okay, getting your mind in the right place to be like, okay, I got to strike a lot this week or, you know, the spare ball is coming out a lot. What's that process kind of like? I try not to think about that. Honestly, I try not to think if, if I need to strike a lot or grind, um, I just feel like I just got to go out there, play the lanes. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, cause if you anticipate having to strike, because everybody else is striking, 
you're not going to strike because yeah. now you put too much pressure on it. Yeah. And then if you're looking at it, oh, this is really hard. You know, it's really hard. Well, someone's going to shoot really good on it. Yeah. I'm just really hoping I'm that person that's going to shoot really good on it. Yeah. Because you know, yeah. you know there's going to be there. So uh, maybe the difference is knowing that when there's when they are harder, that I do have to be more patient. So if I am leaving the temp in, be okay with, okay, I'm just going to keep controlling the pocket. I'm not going to try to be make any super risky moves to try to carry. Whereas when it's a strike fest, you're like, okay, well, I got to do something and I have to do it now. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's usually ger- like that's usually a decision during competition, not prior. Right. Um, I think prior is just, okay, uh, what surfaces do I think I need on my equipment? What bowling balls do I think? This one might work. This, one, this was my best one in practice. Uh, you know, just maybe getting a visual aid of, okay, we're going to start here in practice and then, we have to migrate this way. We will just uh, try to have a little bit of a game plan, I mm-hmm. guess. It's, um, spare shooting, you know, you always expect yourself to make spares. Yeah. Um, sometimes on some of these patterns, uh, I do believe that spares, even if you throw it straight at it, um, I do think that the patterns will affect spares. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember there was a couple times where, like especially like the three six ten, you would throw it at the angle that you normally would, it would hook just enough to chop the three pin off. Mm-hmm. Now, now you say, okay, well, I got to make sure I get it there. And then you really do make sure that you get it there. And now all of a sudden the ball hits that little bit of that oil because it's friction over here, but oil over here. So you hit that oil and it goes in a hydroplane. Yep. Now you put the three pin up and you got the other two and it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> is this the day we're going to have? <laughs> yep. And this is the first year that I ever learned how to manage that because generally when that happens, Spare shooting is just miserable that day and uh, those days. This year, um, usually my focus, my spare ball, is to be as aggressive as I can with it. I have to be really firm with it and make sure I pre- have really good projection. Okay. Uh, just, you know, like that's just what works for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this year, uh, when that situation happened, it was actually just be soft with my hand, like just be really nice to the ball. Hmm. And when I was soft with it, it didn't react to the harshness of the dry or the oil. Okay. So, and on those tournaments where everybody was struggling to make spares, I actually did much better at making spares. And I know in the past that that wouldn't have happened, and that's definitely an improvement for the season. Mm-hmm. So I take every little improvement that I can get. <laughs> that's that's interesting that you have that observation. Now, again, I, I bowl as much as I can, and actually I found a similar thing. Um, quick question. Do you use plastic or do you use urethane? Plastic. I use the DBA poly, the black ball. Okay. Uh, it has to be black. It has to be DBA poly because I don't like having any kind of core or anything. I want my spare ball to go as straight as possible. And in my opinion, that is in our line, that is the straightest ball in our brand. Okay. So. Yeah, and you, you got a lot of choices now, too. We can get into the, the seven brand thing now over the three, but... Um, yeah, I found the same thing. And actually, I think it goes a little bit to your point about how the angles have changed year to year. But like this, for, you know, to last year, 2019 was so straight. Like everything was so long and like the patterns were so blended with forward and reverse. And it was like, if you didn't have that, that big tumbly roll, you were going to mm-hmm. get caught in between so bad. Um, and then with that, then you have to, fire your ball through the heads to get it to spare versus now with big angles um it's softer and one of the weirdest things that i found and maybe you've seen this too is on long patterns so anything beyond like 43 feet um my spare ball hooks at my toes and then it flies through the middle part of the lane and then as soon as it gets to the end of a pattern, I have no idea what it's going to do because it <laughs> because it's either tumbling dead end over end, which I'm the same way. I use a coreless plastic um, or I, I, I had enough tilt to get it to spin through oil. And then as soon as it gets to the end, it just hooks that little bit. And the 3610 is the nemesis for that because it's either a chop or it's either a chop. Or you get, or you get the one out of the middle, which I have unfortunately done too many times. Um, but I, I, I mean, am I, am I? You're the, you're the professional here. But like, is that kind of similar to what you're seeing with the longer stuff? And now, now that they're 
bigger angle patterns where you can just be soft with it and just just you know the oil is going to be there just let the ball do the thing i mean i could be completely crazy i'm not that good of a bowler oh uh, i think it depends and the generally i have a very standard like this is how i release the ball okay like, yeah it's just a very neutral position um for my spares Occasionally, um, when I have a lot of issues with um, it getting through the fronts, and like, I feel like it's like that that little bit of rotation is reacting to it. Yeah, I'll just like, take my hand from like a normal position this way, and I'll just flatten it more and just really get like a more of a dead over end roll because sure. I, I still know I can hit my target. And now I took the ball not to hook, and now it's easier to get to the spot. Mm-hmm. That's something that I will put out, with. and then sometimes it would be about the angles too uh, with long oil. The ball doesn't quite make it that way, so like I feel like I cheat my feet an extra board to the right, um, and on pretty much all my spares. So usually if I'm going to cheat with one spare, it's all the spares. Okay. And, and I just feel a little bit more angle, knowing that I need to get the ball going into that direction. Mm-hmm. And like when you get back to like a normal pattern or a dry pattern, you have to, <laughs> your ball keeps missing. You keep throwing it in the gun. You're like, why is the ball going? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I remember there was an event that I bowled this summer. It was right after we had just bowled on, God, it was like a 30 mil 48 footer. Like, and it was just, it was awful. And, um, I bowled, a. it was, I bowled, then I went, the, the, so that was on a Saturday and I bowled on a 37 footer on Tuesday. And I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing with my spare ball. <laughs> like, I don't even know where it's going to go. I don't know what my hips are doing, my hand, all that. Um, but actually that does kind of lead me into wanting to go back to the idea of versatility. Um, how much, like how much of your, you, you kind of just said it, like you have your typical release, you have your way of like throwing the bowling ball, but you're also able to play you know, first to sixth arrow and everywhere in between. And now you've got four extra brands of bowling balls that you have access to here within the last 18 months or so, if that's my timing is uh, about right there. Um, What are you finding is like the thing that you have to adjust to, or like maybe that, like, what was it this year? You kind of alluded to it with big angles, but like what have the moves been like? Have they been big moves, little moves, like, what is the thing about your game that you're finding you're really having to push towards um, in, I guess, frequently in, in your, maybe your physical game, mental game, uh, even just bowling balls? What's what's kind of what's the thing you're transitioning to? Definitely um, more of, I would say, the mental game side of it. Sure. Uh, it's been really hard to get out of your own head. Um Especially when you have you miss the cut by a couple pins and you miss it again by a couple pins and mentally it just starts draining on you and then, um, you know, because it, it, it's not that you're not physically capable of doing it, it's just now it comes down to the mental game and then, you know, and still making better decisions and I feel like my goal coming out to uh, these events was making small little personal goals for myself, um, things that are achievable and, you know, committing to it, like, you know, committing to staying down in my shot or using my legs um, or just keeping my mind relaxed uh, and not getting caught up with focusing on my physical game. Um, I'm definitely that type of bowler that I just feel like physically, I I mean, I look different in practice versus competition. I see it. You know, there's things that happen. I'm just like, I don't understand why this happens in competition. And I sometimes I really hate watching myself on video because I'm like, is that what I really look like? Um, but then again, you know, like when you get to competition, you have to stop beating yourself up over your physical game. You have to stop thinking about it as much as I do. And it was just really changing up my pre-shot routine, changing up the way that I went through it and getting my mind focused on things that it needed to be focused on, hitting the target. Um, if it was one or two little key things in my physical game, like, okay, drive down your legs, make sure that when I get to that fourth step, I'm like, I'm down. And, you know, that helps me ensure, cause that's not. It's not hard to do. It's mm-hmm. not like I'm making myself do something. It's just something that might need a little bit of attention. Mm-hmm. Or um, the other thing would be just focusing on the top of my swing, being relaxed. Mm-hmm. Again, it's not something that's hard to do. It's just giving my mind something to be be somewhere yeah. while not actually working on my game. And that was, those are the things that I was definitely striving towards um, ever since, like, I want to say about the New York stuff. One of those, like, I really mm. was trying just to transfer over into just 
focusing on the process. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, the other yeah. thing that I've really been working on is getting different um, layouts and uh, different equipment in my hand. Um, between William Clark and Mike Wall, they've both been really trying to help add into it. Um, there was conversation saying that there's too many of the same layouts in my one ball. My one mm-hmm. balls were going too forward up back then. And it was making it to where I couldn't necessarily square up to the lanes, but like as soon as I would move away from it, the ball wouldn't continue down the lane. And it, they were saying that it could have been a lot of the issues that I was having just with ball motion. So right now, um, they've been both of them have been great uh, at helping me. Um, Williams to help me with a couple of things with my footwork, and uh, you know, and it's just it's it's nice to have that support system to know that there's people there that are going to help you. Um, especially with things that I don't know a lot about when it comes to bowling balls. I mean, when we get, when it gets to lane play and bowling balls, cover socks, differential, I mean, yeah, we know about it. And I, I'm sure that there's a lot of girls who know a lot more about it. But to me, it's just like, it's, sometimes it's so hard to wrap your mind around it. It's, it's so complicated and so confusing. Yeah. And I feel like there's, I think what makes it hard for me is um, maybe it's because I like to see things black and white. Right. This is what it is, and this is what it's always going to be. Mm-hmm. This is, you know, this is not what it's going to be. But there's always, in this sport, there's always rules to the exception. I mean, there's always exception to the rules. Mm-hmm. Like, well, you never bowl out on long. Well, look at the look at the, sh- the tournament in um, Spokane. Mm-hmm. We bowl, all bowled out. But mm-hmm. the rule of them is you don't bowl out on long. So mm-hmm. it's like, you know, there's no set of actual rules in the sport to, to abide by. Like, there's always these exceptions, and then you have to know when to do them. Mm-hmm. And I think that makes it complicated because how do you learn something when it works 95% of the time in this situation, but there's still going to be that 5% that it's going to do something completely different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was uh... – like I was saying, I, I would like to focus more on building my knowledge for the equipment okay. and playing playing ball reaction because I do feel like that we have great ball reps and everything, and I think that they're amazing. Mm-hmm. But I would like to be a little bit more independent for myself and right. really start getting better with that. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a big thing, um, which – I, I don't know, like you get to like ball specs and layouts and all that sort of stuff, which I'm a, I'm a physics dork. So when you talk about radius of gyration, I'm like, yeah, that thing. Um, and like, I loved when I first got into bowling and like really just wanted to bowl competitively. I was all about numbers. Like I figured out, um, how to lay out my own stuff pretty much instantly. And then like how to build arsenals around, uh, different numbers and like trying to, trying to understand where each piece fit. And what I actually found was kind of, it was a similar experience to what you're going through, but also for different reasons where um, I forgot to use my eye. <laughs> like I'm trying to outthink this, this lane, this pattern, this, you know, this, this event by using numbers to my advantage and like looking around and seeing what other guys are throwing and all that sort of stuff. And what actually happened was I was throwing the wrong ball because I was convinced it was the right ball because I wasn't looking at what my ball was doing. Um, good example. Um, this was, this was a weird event. It had rained that morning. It was humid as hell, but it was in Minnesota. And this was back when AJ Chapman still lived up there. So he was bowling and Nick Pate too. And it was a, it was Statue of Liberty, which I think is 47 feet if my memory serves me right. And everyone was just hammering on stuff left because it was long pattern. And, um, what ended up happening was the only good look on a 47 foot pattern that day was urethane. And I was like, huh, how does this, how, (laughs) how does that work? Um, so like, I think it's pretty cool for, for yourself to have access to people like Mike Wolf, which he's probably one of the smartest guys in the sport. He probably doesn't get a lot of credit for it. He's also got one of the best games ever, but, um, that's, that's cool though that you have something like that goal. Cause I think that might be, and actually, is that something maybe that you've been missing for the last couple of years of like, give me something besides a title, give me something to strive towards. Because when you were younger, that's kind of what you're talking about. Like I, 
wanted to fulfill something that my coach laid out for me. And like, there was a right way to do it. And if I did that thing, it was fulfilling for, for me most importantly, but also for those that were around me. And I saw progress because of it. Um, do you think that that's like the next thing for you to like give you that fuel to really propel yourself forward? Yeah. I mean, I, a big question as i'm sorry as, as, as much as like the tournaments are disappointing and they're frustrating um it makes me think more about the game it makes yeah. me come back and I'm like okay well the, our new game plan we get to practice we're gonna be doing this we're gonna be working on that and, um i think that unfortunately not being not successful in those events propels me even harder to you know to work harder because i mean i don't want to feel that way i don't want to come back feeling like that sucked you know um I do also think that there's a lot of things in my physical game, you know, that I know needs to get better. And I promise I work on it. And I, you know, I think it's, you know, also that, that when you were a kid, my coach told me to work on something. I worked on it and bam, okay, got it. What's mm. next? You know, now I'm sitting here and my body wants to do one thing and I'm like, no, 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 you guys just sing out. And I'm saying, no, I don't want to. Mm. <laughs> so um, it, it's a lot harder when I mean, you have, what, 20 years of that, of, of certain habits that you're trying to get your body to do something different, it doesn't want to change as easy. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things I think that actually really kind of brought some light to my improvements was that I did pull up a video from maybe even college, like right after college, and I saw some, and I'm like, yeah, I guess I remember thinking that I was never going to be able to get my, my uh, right, my fourth step to not step, like, 10 boards to the right, uh, the, you know, the step, you know, and now I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh, it's actually straight to, you know, okay, crosses over, cool, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm like, I remember I couldn't even get it straight back then, straight, like, if I got it into a couple boards, it was, like, hard, mm -hmm. so I, I guess that, you know, I'm still always being hard on myself for not being where I want to be, but at the same time, when I look at this video, I'm like, well, you, you're going in the right direction, you are getting better, mm -hmm. just not as fast as you want to, right. And, I've and always come down to being patient too. Yeah. You know, you get, like you said, you kind of get used to that rate of improvement early on. And then like over time, like inevitably the rate of improvement is going to slow down because not only are you, um, your bot, you're, you're built, you're potentially breaking those old habits that are really installed, but also the adjustments that you're making are so micro and micro adjustments are really, really hard to make. Macro adjustments are easy, right? Like yeah. if I need to convert from a four step to a five step approach, that's an easier thing to teach rather than, well, when you're, when you're hitting your timing point, your hand is like a quarter turn over the, you know, the side of the ball and you need to be 100% around or behind it. Like that's such a small thing that can make such a big difference. And we understand that, but it's so hard to change. And it doesn't like when it feels it's hard right. To feel something like that as well. Yeah. Yeah. You're even doing it. Um, so, so it, it is, it is hard to, to have even that perspective, like consistently of, I am improving. Um, it's just, it's on little stuff and it's little things all the time. And like, and then I'm, I'm going to be good at one thing today and I'm going to be trash at something today. And then tomorrow it might be different. Um, actually I, I have a question that's, um, maybe might seem strange, but I promise there's a point. Are you a reader? Do you enjoy reading? Oh, yes, yes. Have you read the book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck? No. I recommend it. I, I right by the title, I can tell how I would like it. Yeah. So, um, so big thing for me is, so in my professional life and personal life, um, I'm a big believer in growth mindset, and I try, to, I try to engage people on the concept of growth mindset as much as I can. So um, I caution most people before reading that book because it can be misconstrued very rapidly because mm -hmm. the principle of the book is, is, um, is to be like a duck. It's water off your back, right? It's, it, it, you can't let the mountains turn into molehills. You can't let the little thing in just completely overtake your mind. You have to have perspective. So the things that when you have perspective are small, 
don't care about them. Like they're going to happen. We're going to throw bad shots. We're going to have bad days, that sort of thing. And it's about focusing on the, the bigger things and focusing on the process and being able to have a purpose behind what you do rather than just being sucked into the, the rigmarole and the mundane type stuff. But what happens when people um, re- refer to this book is I always ask them, I was like, well, what do you actually care about? Because if you, if you, if you don't care about anything, then you're going to care about nothing. If you try to use this book, right? You have to have something that's like, no, this is what's important over here. Like I'm focusing on this thing and I don't give a fuck about the rest. And I normally don't like to swear on this, but, um, yeah, I I would say, uh, check it out because, um, if you, you know, you talk about how, you know, the, the, the couple times where you really had that like really loose swing, which propelled you towards success. Maybe that's what it was. It was just being able to just whew, nice deep breath out. We're just going to go do this thing because this is why we're here. Um, and if you can have that mindset, I don't know, maybe it'll help. I think you'll like it. I think I would too. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like something I would like to read. It does make sense too. It's um, because there are, there are always these little things that we care about too much while competing and, uh, Truthfully, you got to just be. It's, it, it's hard. I think this is hard for me because this is not my personality. But when you're on the lanes, you have to be selfish. It's, it has to be mm-hmm. about you. And mm-hmm. I, I don't think that, that I, that's something that's really easy for me to adapt to because um, that's not my personality in general. But um, you have to not care if you accidentally, like, you know mess up or you offend somebody. I mean, anyway, I mean, not, like when I say offend somebody, I mean, yeah. talk about like the link or see, sometimes mm-hmm. you jump people and, mm-hmm. or you, you're, you're worried that you're taking too much time. And, you know, that's the biggest thing, especially bowlers who uh, don't know how to do the double jump. They just rush there and they just get up there and it's like, you know what, this is my time. I need to do what I need to do to execute a good shot. So if that person has to wait for me, sorry, you're going to have to wait, mm-hmm. you know, instead of trying to speed up my process to accommodate them. Mm-hmm. And I think that's like so, like something that you just have to eventually learn how to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and it sucks because that's that's how you have to be. Yeah, everything has to be more about you when you're on the lanes because it's about being successful. Mm-hmm. But um, it, it, I don't think it for me. It's not the easiest thing to do. Do you that's all I'm do you bowl USBCs, the team championships, all that sort of stuff? I have. Yeah. Um, it, it sometimes it's just been hard to match up with our schedule since tour okay. season's back and. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, because even if we can go to it, sometimes it's nice to have that week home to be able just mm-hmm. to breathe and maybe yeah. even just get some work on your game and get some stuff figured out. So yeah. and traveling can be a little bit hard, you know, just being away from everybody. Plus, I do coach full time. So, okay. you know, I have people that are relying on me as well. So when I come home, you know, I, I want to be here for them as much as I can. Yeah. For sure. The reason that I ask is um, that that idea of selfishness is actually something that I learned in that event, because um, the first couple of years that I bowled it, um, you know, they, they give you that like three and a half hour warning. And we got red flagged the first year that I bowled it for bowling too slow because no one could strike because it was my first year bowling nationals and no one knew what they were doing. And that's whatever. But um uh, the so like the two years after that it was like a rush it was a race it was I forgot that I was bowling and I was just trying to be done bowling right because I didn't want to get red flagged and then um, 2019 the the was the first year that our team shot over 3,000 and the entire goal the whole time was yes throw good shots but we are gonna be the last team done. Like take mm-hmm. your time because guess what? They're going to, they're not going to kick us off. They're not going to say you're done. Um, and what ended up happening was number one, we were the last team done, but um, <laughs> we, no, nobody got flagged. Nobody got red flagged because we struck so much more that we were just able to take our time in between our shots. And ever since then it has completely shifted my mindset on like, it doesn't matter what that person to my right's doing um, because I'm here to bowl. And I think in singles tournaments, too that's got to be tough because like you know if some like you like you kind of said if you're bowling a long pattern you kind of know where you're supposed to play it and then yeah. if you look two pairs to your left and there's somebody that is just 
ham and a 500 grit something up five and then two pairs to your right somebody who's into fifth arrow and you're just like man if we all played this together this would be so much easier why aren't they doing that and then you're playing it right like the correct <laughs> way is that something that you like is that kind of what you're referring to where you're like you're not selfish in that way no not not that way okay okay yeah, i didn't feel like that with the women's tour Generally, we all either eventually find our way to the same spot or we're very close. I don't feel like anybody really plays them bad, if that makes oh, sense. Yeah. Um, it, 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 mostly you experience that when you're going with amateurs or like regionals and stuff where everybody's a little bit over the place and you just have a surface. Or maybe even you, you have a couple of new bowlers in there that just don't, aren't as experienced mm -hmm. that might do that. But the um, ratio is not there so much. I mean, it, it, most of the women, we all find the same spot or same kind of area or break point. I mean, how we get to it's obviously different. Like, nobody's going to do it the way Daria does it or Maria. <laughs> right. Um, but we still are generally doing very similar stuff. Yeah. Like, the break point. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I've, I found that I, with... Go ahead. Sorry. No, you're, no, you're I good. Like, I was referring to, like, a lot of, like, new bowlers who come in. They just start rushing because... Oh, I got Kelly Kelly next to me. I don't, I don't want her waiting on me, you know. And mm -hmm. you know, even sometimes, like I just like to have a little extra second, and I might even skip my turn, especially if we are a threesome and everybody's a foursome. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I might just say, "Hey, go ahead," but then they feel rushed that so they have to go. And I'm like, "No, oh, just, just take your time. I don't mind waiting. Just, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't want other people to feel like they have to rush for me." Mm -hmm. And I guess the biggest thing that what really triggered my mindset was that I was always caring so much about what other people were thinking or like being so courteous to them. And you realize that they were just, they didn't care. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like they didn't care if they were that courteous. Like when I get the shot, I don't care if I'm going to take a long time or not. Uh, you know, we're talking about like the better players because they're, they're going to go out there and do what they need to do mm -hmm. to throw that strike. So mm -hmm. if they are going to take a longer time, they're going to do that. And it's like, well, why am I caring so much about what everybody else is thinking when they're so focused on them and they don't care? So I'm like, I started thinking about it. And I'm like, well, because the ultimate goal is to go out there and be successful. We're not friends. We're not supposed to be best friends all on the lanes. We're supposed to be competitors. I mean, yes, we have friendships and we're friends off the lanes. But when yeah. you're on the lanes, it's, it's, that's our job. This is our money. This is our livelihood. It, you know, it, as, as um, brutal, brutal as it sounds, like your mindset has to be different. Yeah. It's unfortunate because that's not, like I said, that's not my personality, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah you, you, you kind of referred to it earlier that you're really competitive, but I think there's a diff there's, there's maybe two mindsets and maybe, maybe, maybe I'm catching on to something here where you're, you are competitive against yourself. Like you want to execute to the highest level that you can and maybe not necessarily because that's, that's what bowling is, right? Like bowling is you against yourself. You will only bowl as good as you let yourself bowl. Um, there's really, you know, we're not in, we're not bowling on a team in in most of our environments, um, and we're certainly uh, not bowling, quote unquote, against somebody. You know, there is technically you can play defense if you really have to, but if you play defense, you're never going to really win. Um, bowling is you against 60 feet and 10 pins. And if you can be really, really competitive with yourself, um, that will get you really, really far because it, mm -hmm. it, there's so much that you can do to make yourself better. But there is also that mindset of like, I need to step on some throats today. And that's hard. That's so hard for, I think, a lot of people to do. And maybe not to that level, but is that kind of what you're referring to where it's like, no, I, I need to beat these people <laughs> now too. No, not so much for that one because I'm, <laughs> I'm okay with being people. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'll like, you know, even if it's like a, a tournament where um, – I'm not bowling well. Yeah. I already know I'm not going to make the cut. But I'm also, I don't give up on any event. Like, I still, you know, I still have that, like, well, we could still shoot amazing and possibly make it. So then sometimes I'll be, like, looking at a certain bowler, like, okay, me and this person are close. And it might be, like, a really good bowler, someone that I respect, and be like, okay, I'm going to beat them. But, like, you know, like, just to have something, like, to – to kind of like push forward because, you know, just to keep it competitive, even though like I might be like 200 pence out of the cat or something mm -hmm. or whatever yeah. it is, you know, 
Because right. uh, I do like that competitiveness. I do like, like you know, trying to, to, you know, competing against other people as well. Because, like I said, I am very competitive. I do have a lot of personal goals, and I do I am hard on myself in that way as well. And I think that's why I do like practicing because I, I do have that that personal competitiveness as well. But I wouldn't say that it's more one way or over the other. Okay. Um, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, okay. What's your favorite place to bowl at? <sighs> can, I say, can I say my home bowling center? Absolutely. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I think I, you know, honestly, I think I really liked bowling at Fountain Valley, and mm. it unfortunately is not on our. T- I'm not sure if they closed down or if they're just not on our tour anymore. But um, they they were definitely one of my favorite places to visit. Um, I always bowled very well there. I liked the lanes; it matched up really well. Um, plus, the owner of the bowling center was amazing. He would. Every year he would throw out like this big um, barbecue party for the girls, and you know it, it just always felt very welcoming as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Reno used to be my very favorite until they changed the lanes, because I used oh. to bowl very good at that center. And then once they uh, went over and they changed the lanes, uh, I don't bowl bad there. It's it just not as good. <laughs> Isn't that crazy how big of a difference that that made? Like. Because mm-hmm. when they switched panels in was it 2016, 2017? It's around there at least. It was, it was it was right after Matt McNeil ran everyone over two years in a row, <laughs> <laughs> and like it, it, that's actually interesting because that was before then that was a prototypical like lefty house. What was it about pre new install that you really liked about the stadium? I can't say I knew a hundred percent because I know what I think. Sometimes what you think you see versus what you actually see are two different things. Yeah. Um, well, I, I obviously struck a lot there. Uh, when we had, uh, back when I won the regional, we actually got to have like a, a, a mini event there. I made Team USA there, Charles there. I placed seventh at Queens there. Um, I think that because I think what I did like at the time was that I think because the lanes I think are a little bit angled down and a little bit this way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I feel like I struggle getting my ball through the front part of the lane. Now, if, if I'm explaining it properly, it's more of what my eye sees mm-hmm. versus I, I'm not sure that's what's actually happening. Mm-hmm. But um, with my ball roll and my speed, I feel like it's hard for me to get the ball to go that way easy because it hits the lane and wants to do that. Mm-hmm. So when I get up there and I throw the ball and I can see my ball has a, a certain cleanness to that spot, mm-hmm. it's like, Okay, oh, I, I don't have to fight it. I don't have to make it. And I think that's also something that I need to still get better at because even on our tour, when I see long whale and low volume, I'm like, all right, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to play some tricks today, you know, mm-hmm. just because it just doesn't work out well for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but ultimately, I think it was just more of like knowing that my ball is gonna get through that part of the lane, and it created that motion that I really liked to see, mm-hmm. and. Uh, so and it, I, I think that I'm not sure if there's anything major different now from then. It's just I haven't been as successful. And usually I never really struggled at that center. Mm-hmm. I think it's different. Um, it's hard to say specifically what is different about it, but any any time you change your your friction um, environment, it's going to be different. But the fall classic is out there in October, right? Uh yes, yes, sir. Are you? I are, think that's- Second. No, it's good. It's all we, we we switch gears and then we switch back there for a second. But uh, are are you you're going out for the fall classic, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. See, there you go. That'll that'll be the one. You'll be able to get back where you really like to ball. You'll be able yeah. to get your ball through the heads, and then you're just gonna outstrike everybody, right? Like it, I think that that's a part of the mindset that you gotta walk into that with. Like, hey, I love going out there, and then. Um, I don't remember how did you do at the Queens this year because that was in the stadium too, right? I like uh, the Queens. I bowled so well, and I I just missed the cut, and okay. it I just couldn't get the ball to go through the pins. Mm-hmm. And I feel like sometimes when like I'm struggling with most of my events, it's like I just don't get. It. It was a lot of time pens, mm-hmm. a lot of fairs I had to make. Uh, just you know, you I missed for all of the games. Like it was 15 games. I think it was. One actual one single pin and maybe two makeables. Mm-hmm. When you think about that for 15 games, that's all I miss as far as routine fares. 
And if it, you know, if it was even that much and I didn't even make a cut, mm-hmm. like I just, you know, and that one came down to having to strike. Yeah. It was, it, the cut was still, it wasn't super high, but you still had a, what was it like? Was it negative? Was it positive one? I, I, mean, I guess you didn't have to strike I, that much. I thought it was like minus 20. Because one of my one of my friends from up here, she flew out there and she she was like sixty third, and it was just right around even. But yeah, yeah, I think it was around even. Yeah, um, I think it was, I think the cut was at like either minus one or a positive one. But yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, something like that. And I wasn't, I was only, I wasn't a lot of pins, like maybe twenty pins short or something. Mm-hmm. When you really look at it, and I mean, there's so many shots that you're just in there like that that one just struck, you know, and. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I had to make change angles, my ball reaction did something a little bit different. Um, but yeah, and that was another tournament that I walked away. Like there's times I'll walk away and be like, I, I gave it everything I got. I executed good shots. I had a good mind for me. I did what I could and it just didn't happen. And yeah. Fortunately, that was the U.S. Open and the Queens this year. Yeah. Which is- pretty miserable that I had to be on two big events. But Well, the other thing about that is the USBC events – are so hard like just in at least on the the ladies tour i don't like the men's tour like i think that they're actually nicer to the men um in terms of like building the lane patterns but like the the queen's pattern was really hard um and then the especially with trying to get it to go through the pins the right way uh, but yeah. then the U.S. Open too. I think like I don't I don't remember the gentleman's name that actually designs the patterns. I want to say his name's Nick. Um, but like that's like really just mean some of the stuff that they put together because I think he was the same guy that did all the patterns in 2017 and 2018. Or there was like there was a similar group, and that was just like all of those were just so savage. And mm-hmm. if you didn't. That was- but I think I really liked it, to be honest. But that was when you were, you were kind of saying that you had to get your ball to get end over end, right? Mm-hmm. And I, that, it, well, if it was a year where, like, it, I think it, it was a grind fest for everybody, I really enjoyed that. Year. Yeah. 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 I can remember, like, okay, you come out and you shoot 180, and it's like, okay, that's a good game. And it's like, okay, I can do that. <laughs> that's what I do every tournament, 180s, 190s. <laughs> yeah. That's, it's such a, I think there's so many people that walk into those tournaments though with a mindset like, hey, I'm going to shoot 230 and it's like, uh-uh, this, tur- this pattern is not going to let you shoot 230 every game and it seems to be the USBC ones and I think it all started, the when, when I recognized it, it was when Andrew Anderson won the Masters out in Syracuse because that pattern was freaking impossible. Um, how he was able to do what he did with playing that part of the lane and actually strike a ton was weird. But then I was like, wait, every single time USBC is putting together one of these events, they're putting together the hardest possible patterns that they can. And this U S open was the, yeah. the, like, it was just a conglomeration of just freaking impossible patterns. Um, now I know we kind of talked about it and we don't have to sit on it for too terribly long, but what was the thing that, what was the barrier for you? Was it, was it physical game stuff? Was it getting your hit ball through the fronts? Was it the mental thing? What was it about that tournament that kind of got to you? Uh, I think it was just caring, just getting the ball through the pants. Like, yeah. I mean, it was hard. I mean, especially when you go strike, 10 pin strike, pocket 7, 10 split. And now, like, and there was a lot of pocket 7, 10 splits. I mean, not just for me, from everybody. Yeah. So. So now you're hitting the pocket and you're leaving pocket splits, and now it's like, okay, well, now I have an open and I can't double to cover it up. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that playing lanes better, being smarter, um, maybe have a different equipment. Maybe we only could choose, like, or not in lane because it's like 10 bowling balls. But. <laughs> well, come on. But like, you. Know, you- well, even like when we had the first pattern, like I thought I was going to crush the first pattern because I had amazing ball reaction in practice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it wasn't just on one pair of lanes. Like I traveled across the center and it was good everywhere. And I was like, mm-hmm. okay, cool. Then we had our 10 minutes of practice or 30 minutes or an hour or whatever before we started. Ball reaction was amazing. And I'm like, okay, today's a good, good, good day. You know, even had a great mindset, felt good. Got to my pair of lanes and I was like, <laughs> like it was not, it was not there like it was the ball motion was not there and it's like yeah. what is this you know and um i think what made it really hard as well 
was the differences from lane to lane and pair to pair because there were definitely some pairs that you had to move further left and then you get caught up being far left because it's always so hard to go back right when you go when you're left and there was times where we actually had to get back to the right and um you know, like I said, just making smarter decisions mm-hmm. is really, when I think about most of my bowling, I always come down to, I wish I would have changed to that ball or that line, mm-hmm. that release, just do that a little bit differently because as much as I may not be happy with where my physical game is, realistically, I can shoot two threes, I can shoot two threes, I can hit my target. You know, as soon as you see a little bit of area, your swing listens up. You can, I can throw a good score. So, mm-hmm. you know, as a capability of a bowler, it's there. Mm-hmm. You know, and I can't be blaming so much on my physical game all the time. And, you know, it has to, this game isn't even, as you know, they are hard. Uh, like, US Open is obviously the exception. But uh, this game is changing more to be a, uh, an area game, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, even if you looked at the, the Empress of the Lanes event, mm-hmm. and it, there, there's absolutely no disrespect to any bowlers because I think everybody's fantastic, but when you look at the lines and the angles, even when you see the people who were on top of every line, every angle, they lost the games to somebody who may have had a wider like mm-hmm. range. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It's the fact is that that person had the right call in the right part of the lane and they create an area because mm-hmm. now that's more where the game is transferred into is being a smart player, getting the right ball in your hand, being in the right part of the lane because now you're creating area for yourself. Mm-hmm. It's not as much as being precision. If you have area and you're precise, now it's, it's bonus. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's probably um, – that's been one of the most interesting things in trying to coach is um, being able to let – because I coach high school is let kids figure out, okay, it's, it's maybe not about hitting the exact same spot at the arrows every time. It's about having a loose swing and being matched up because if you, if you're loose and you have a little bit of area and you got the right ball and you're in the right zone, you don't really have to be perfect. You can be, you can be really good and like, it'll strike a lot. It may be not strike every time, but you're never going to strike every time. And yeah, that's, that's actually, um, I think that's a really good example with the Empress stuff because, um, you know, I watched every ball of that entire tournament and, um, you know, I, I, I thought that Dario was throwing the wrong ball, throwing the IQ tour that she was throwing. I, cause the ball motion sucked. Like I like Daria. I think she's a phenomenal bowler. Um, and I was like, why aren't, cause I, cause she ball changed in a fill ball to a Zen. And I was like, that's good motion. And then she went back to it and then she won. And I was just like, you just can open her eight hits. <laughs> like, like that's not supposed to work. And, and it's just, you know, right, right ball, right zone. And maybe it isn't pretty, but that's, I think, I don't know. Do you have a hard time? Do you have a hard time convincing yourself that a look like that's the right look where it's just, it's just the pins just hit each other and it's just crumbly and gross. Um, yes and no. Um, yes, because you want to see that the 10 back or, you know, that strike. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes that actually isn't what the lanes need or what they call for. I mean, every blank center is different. Sometimes they like light hits versus um, heavy hits. And, um, is you know, sometimes it gets down to the point where we try to make adjustments off of seeing what our ball is going through the pins because we have all this knowledge. But the ball's striking. It's, I, like, I did that at that press of the lane. Uh, not the Empress, I'm sorry. The Queen Storm and I bowled this weekend. I made a ball change. And I went to, like, my knockout. And I'm just, like, watching you down the lane. And I'm like, ugh. I was like, I don't like how it's going to the pins. But I got three strikes in a row, four strikes in a row. And I'm like, it's striking. Yeah. I'm like, okay. I don't have to like what it, what it looks like as long as the pins are going down. And, you know, and I end up using it. And it was really good. It may not have looked, may not have matched what my eye liked to see. But... Mm-hmm. Maybe what my eye wanted to see wasn't right because, you know, while reactions that I liked, things that I saw, I would love 10 minutes. And, and I know with that tournament, there was a lot of high scores that there was no room to be leaving 10 minutes. There was no room to be not striking at that point in time. So 
when I got a ball that did strike, it didn't really matter. Mm-hmm. It didn't matter what it looked like. Right, right. And it, gave me, and it did give me area too. So mm-hmm. I, I had a little bit of miss room. Now, granted, maybe a miss was either a strike or a temp in, but it was in the pocket, and that's good enough for me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, if every tournament, if you can get nine or 10, like 90% of your shots, you're going to be damn close <laughs> it's not well above most of the field um what was the event that you bowled this weekend because i know you won on saturday it was a princess queen tournament okay. um a lot of local bowlers came out and bowled it and have like different age i mean not age i'm sorry different average divisions so oh. like maybe like a 115 and under so and the lower divisions when you win, you're considered to be a princess, and then when you win the the, the highest one, the 200 above average one, then you're a queen. Mm-hmm. And that was that was my division. Um, we did have a lot of good bowlers come out to the event. Uh, a lot of good local bowlers. Um, it wasn't easy. Yeah. But by any means, I mean, like I said, like every time I looked up, somebody shooting 250, and I'm just I'm like, okay, I'm gonna just take my 220, 230. Yeah. You know? And just stood in my game saying, you know what, I can't control what other people do. I can't control if they're striking a lot or whatever. The only thing I can control is what I'm doing. I'm executing good shots. I'm just – biggest thing was making um, better decisions on the lanes. Um, so a good friend of mine uh, – I'm not going to mention any names because I know he's yeah. not going to want me to yeah. mention any names. You're good. He's the only person who wants to help me just to help me. Mm-hmm. Um, he's been practicing with me, and he knows I've been struggling with ball motion. And uh, we were discussing things that, like, when I'm in a tournament, what would my process be in changing bowling balls or equipment, or how would you see the lanes? And we were on the lanes with my equipment, and we were playing different angles. And, well, you see, when your ball did this, you temp in, or it didn't even come back. But when you got to the spot, it did something different. And really just showing me the difference in my equipment and how I can utilize it differently. Um, and I texted him after, I was like, hey, you know, the stuff that we talked about, I use. And the, the biggest thing that he had told me was that, you know, when we have our arsenal laid out from, like, our most aggressive earliest balls to our weakest balls going this way, um, you know, we try to follow too much of an order, like, from this ball to this ball to this ball to that ball. And then we find, like, you know, we slowly work our way around. When he said what you actually should be looking for is – if your ball has a certain motion, a certain shape, your next ball down should be a weaker version of that type of ball. Mm-hmm. And I was doing, okay, so I'd go for my Obsession Tour to my Black Widow to probably my Knockout, but it's like, in my mind, I'm like, well, these never work because my Knockout's too early, or, or not my Knockout, my um, Game Breaker 4, I mean, it's too early. Mm-hmm. And uh, really starting to categorize, so like, I sat down, and I categorized all my bowling balls, like, okay, uh, by shapes. Like, okay, this is a shape that I see from these four or five balls. These are the shapes. Now, the order of it is, like, all over the place. Like, mm-hmm. they're not, like, actually in order, but they're, like, categor- now I'm categorizing my arsenal by shapes that I mm-hmm. see. So now when I got to change balls, I'm not thinking about the other equipment. I'm thinking of this certain ball. Mm-hmm. Unless I feel as though I need something a little bit different because of the part of the lane that I'm getting into. Mm-hmm. But overall, seeing a certain shape, and following a shape of a ball versus a weaker going off, okay, well, this is differential, this is RG. Mm-hmm. This ball's weaker, and we're going down our arsenal that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is actually what I did do. And even to, like, you know, like, from when I made my adjustment from my Obsession Tour to my Knockout, it, you know, like, I skipped about, like, three, three, three or four bowling balls to mm-hmm. get to it. Yeah. But I made it because of what we discussed, and it worked, and... You know, that's something that I think I'll be excited to really start uh, getting better with and utilizing, you know. And, I mean, I, I did compete in a tournament yesterday, and I did still have the same thought process, same mm-hmm. everything. And I felt like I bowled very well, mm-hmm. very high scoring. So, I mean, I came in, like, 17th. And there was only two of us. Verity and me were the only two females out of an uh, all-guys field. Mm-hmm. We bowled on um, Dead Man's Curve, which was, I believe, 43 feet, uh, 24 mils. Mm-hmm. So um, we had to get deep. Like I was, I look at dots. I, I actually oh, okay. look at angles and dots. Yeah. Uh, not dots of the felon, a little bit past. Mm-hmm. Uh, my eyes got to about, I think like thirty at the dots. Woo! Like that. <laughs> um, 
Well, then, yeah, yeah, yeah I, 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 that pattern had to have just gotten yeah, shredded. The later ones, but yeah, you can see how deep I actually did have to get. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that, like, my last two games was a 195 and a 184, and even, like, I keep going back and I'm thinking about those games, and I'm like, I wish I either knew what to do better in those games or made a little bit better adjustments, but I still tried utilizing the adjustments that I was already learning and I'm already trying to apply it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I still learn from it, and I'm still getting to the point where I'm like, okay, well, execution was good that tournament. Just yeah. really down to ball reaction, just yeah. making better decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's something that the really good players do. They're just really good at their equipment and knowing what to change to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. I think that's going to be an awesome strategy f for you because, like you said, the physical game is is there. You're going to have your micro adjustments and, and things that you're working on. But um, one thing that even I've done and I've coached people to try to do with building arsenals, especially with kids because you've only got, like, access to maybe three or four is – find bowling balls that even just like pair well together. So if I'm in this part of the lane with this ball and then that goes away, what's the ball that pairs with it? Like, just, let's just think about this in groups of two. Um, so I, I, you know, in, in a nice part about that is let's take the obsession tour, for example. And well, now they've got the gold ball, like yeah. maybe and now I, I haven't thrown the gold ball, but maybe, you know, that's the right part of the lane for that ball. And if it's just, this one's not working, try this one. And then if that doesn't work, yeah. get a different pair of two bowling balls, go to a different zone and try those because you just, <laughs> you're just kind of restarting. I don't know. Is that maybe I'm, I'm probably crazy, but I've always thought about it yeah. in groups of two. Yeah, so. no, that, that does make sense too. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the Empress show because that's got to be one of the coolest environments that you've ever bowled in. Honestly, it was so much fun. I loved it, every bit of it. Yeah, well, I, um, yeah. Tell tell me about Bayside. You know, the people are amazing. Everybody's mm -hmm. so friendly, very welcoming. Um, you know, PBA. Uh, I enjoyed working with everybody. I, you know, Danielle was. Is super nice and just very attentive. Um, and I just overall was a very fun event, and mm -hmm. I hope to have the opportunity to do something like that again because mm -hmm. um, it was definitely different and it was fun, um, competitive. It had, had every and it. I know that like a lot of viewers at home are like, well, we don't like when the audience you know chants like that or whatever. But I think that that actually adds a little something. Like it actually makes it fun for the players as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I I could be wrong for other people, but for me. It was fun. It was fun to be able to engage with them, you know. And I think that Daria is also that person where she like she feeds off of that environment, that crowd, and um, I personally loved it. Yeah. Um, uh, um, so actually, that leads me to another question that I have for you because um, I have my own theories, but um, how does how does Ashley Galante make the game of bowling better? How do I make the game of bowling better? Like, in your opinion, like, not not necessarily, like, what do you contribute to improve the sport? But, like, if you could change anything about bowling, what would you change about it, to, in, in your opinion, to make it make it better from it, the professional level, from the amateur level, anything? Like, what's the thing that, like, just kind of grinds your gears a little bit that you'd love to fix? I guess... I truly believe that this is a sport, and I think that outsiders don't view it as a sport, mm -hmm. um, even to the to the aspect of it not being in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And to me, I would like the adjustments, whatever needed to be made for viewers to be able to see us more of a sport and be able to be in Olympics, whether it's... Uh, now, I mean, I, I think some of the stuff I would say is very unrealistic, but maybe being able to take away uh, bad carry versus lucky carry. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, you can have a, somebody who threw a great shot and, like, okay, the pins were off rack or something, mm -hmm. and now they got packed seven times split, and then the other person goes run away Brooklyn and wins. So, I mean, there's still a very – there's a luck factor to the sport. Um, but, I mean, you still have to put yourself in that position to be lucky. I mean, right. there's still a lot of it too that people don't view. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the scoring aspect of it, uh, which has been around for centuries. And I, I don't really have a problem with it, but when you think about like 
going into the Olympics and you're seeing how outsiders view it, um, you and I could be bowling against each other. We can literally have the same exact score. So you have nine spare strike, nine spare strike, and all my nine spares are together and all my strikes are together. And now you're only shooting 2-0 where I might be shooting 2-20, 2-30. And that's a huge difference for having the same exact score. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's also something that is being viewed as, uh, you know, different for our score. And they do play around. Like when you see some of the, the events that the guys have done in the past, mm-hmm. they play around with a different type of scoring system. Mm-hmm. I believe a lot of it is because they're trying to figure out some a way to eliminate some of that that factor of, you know, having t- the same score and two different scores. Mm-hmm. Um, that way maybe eventually it could also be a Olympics. Interesting. Not really- I'm not really sure why it's not. I'm not really sure if I'm even accurate or not. That's just more of a personal opinion. Yeah. No, that's that's, it, a, that's all I was asking good, for. That's kind of what I would I would change because I believe bowling should be in the Olympics. Yeah. I think that it is a very challenging sport, and I think that we are competitors. I think we are athletes, and we deserve that opportunity mm-hmm. to be there. I completely agree. And if the ladies' tour shows an example of anything, is that it is also an international sport. Like yeah. literally every corner of the world, there's all these women that are coming to the United States to bowl 12 events a summer, like everywhere. Yeah. And I com- yeah, I completely agree that it's I know the best of the best too. I mean, yeah. like, especially when you have like Singapore coming out and yeah. uh, Malaysia, I mean, they're, they're great competitors they Mm -hmm. really are Mm -hmm. Um, and that's not even to get into now i don't know a lot of the women's side but the men's bowling in dubai is ridiculous mm -hmm. like where rafik because that's where rafik is from i believe is from dubai like they have so many guys that are so good like i don't know why it's not everyone that i've talked to about it says it's a money thing which i think is dumb but it's because it's the olympics like how much and I get that there's money in the Olympics, but I, I don't know. I, I hopefully one day we will see it get into the Olympics, but um, actually that transitions me into my theory that I want to throw at you because um, like I said, when we kind of started, you've built a social media following that is pretty substantial. Um, I think the way that bowling Uh, from a professional level improves is number one, there has to be more money injected into the sport. I think that's, you know, because, because, because of the fact that golf and bowling coexist in this ether of like, well, if you're a golfer, you're a bowler. And if you're a bowler, you're a golfer type thing. Um, But golf, you know, Roy McIlroy is making $300 million a year or some ridiculous amount of money. Um, I think we need to have the opportunity to inject more money into the sport. The way that you're yeah. going to do that is through sponsor money, right? Well, what do sponsors want? They want eyeballs. They don't necessarily care about the talent or like the fact that, you know, somebody's playing the lane the right way and the difference between good and bad carry, which makes the sport better, but they want eyeballs. They want attention. They want people to see yeah. their name on TV. And I think the way that they do it is you have to, I think the, the athletes, if they can create a an environment where they when they're on tv it's not necessarily about i go watch bowling it's no i'm gonna go watch this person bowl because i follow her on instagram and she's got a cool tiktok channel and i really want her to win so i'm gonna be deeply invested in this Uh, brad and kyle are also another good example because when they're on tv ratings go through the freaking roof it's ridiculous Mm -hmm. Um, so now think about that in the macro though, think about having a, an entire TV show of five ladies that have significant social media followings and they're able to be like, Hey, we're going to be, uh, when we're in these finals and they happen to be on CBS sports or whatever it ends up being on, and you want to watch, like, it's not yeah. necessarily like compulsory that somebody does, but also that to me is something where it goes from giving the TV entities, the bargaining chip, and it takes it back because it's it, now it's not CBS Sports is allowing us on TV. It's they don't have a choice because our ratings are going to be so high when this happens because there are five people that they want to be or that their audience wants them on national TV so bad 
they can't say no. And then when they yeah. can't say no, then it's like, well, because the sponsor dollars are all going to come flooding in. Am I, I'm now I'm a theorist, but I think I'm onto something there. And you've, you've had the social media following for a long time. How has that kind of played out for you? Um, <laughs> I'm crazy. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm, let me, can you explain your question a little bit better? For so, me? so yeah, I guess there was more, I, I, I guess maybe I didn't have much of a question in there, but, um, it, do you do you think that if there was more of a an ability out of the, the the large majority of the field to generate attention in through the channels of social media that it would improve viewership and therefore improve sponsorship and therefore make the game better by us having um, you know like you said with Brad and Kyle they have a big viewing. And um, ratings go up when they are on TV. Just as so, I know back in a long time ago, Pete Weber was that person as well. And mm -hmm. uh, Jason Belmont was still one of those people. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that it, it's a uniqueness. Like I think Jason has captured an outside audience based off of his his branding, mm -hmm. but also his uniqueness of you know. Everyone knows Jason as the two-handed bowler. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I remember we were at a tournament and we walked to my hotel and there's a whole baseball team and we saw we were bowlers. We're like, oh, do you know Jason Belmonte? And it's like, well, it's really cool that a whole baseball team that's obviously not bowlers, but they know Jason Belmonte. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so if he's on TV, I'm sure those people, that would probably be a question for bowling. Uh, they'll, they'll watch it because of him. <laughs> Are we good? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just, it's just one of my crazy theories because that's one of the things that I really want this to kind of turn into is um, really just giving people like yourself the opportunity to engage on a different platform that can develop an audience that maybe isn't exclusively oh, just bowlers because – I love marketing. I love bowling. So let's just put these two things together because if we grow the sport, um, everyone's life gets better. You know, we don't, we, we, if, if we can, if we can make, you know, the last cash spot go up three times in value, everyone's life gets better. Um, so that's one of the things I think accessibility to professional athletes is the way that is a way that that can be done because the more, um, the more that we're able to put a, a human to the face that we see on TV or on flow bowling or on bowl TV, the, the better our viewership will be and everything else that comes with that. So I think that you've, like I said, I think that you've kind of done that. I don't know what your response was after being on the Empress show. Cause that was your most re recent national TV experience. Was there, you know, how did you get a, did you get a big pour of DMS into your Instagram after that? Or kind of, what was that kind of like? Um, I do. I, my following did go increase from it for yeah. sure. Um, you know, and I, I do think that there was a lot of messages as well yeah. uh, that I try to do my best to keep up with. Um, yeah, it's tough. I, I'm not just a full-time bowler. I have a full-time job. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, life can be very challenging at times because I, I, like you can see, I probably post more on social media when I'm traveling mm -hmm. than when I'm home. Mm -hmm. because I have downtime. Okay, I'm at the airport. I have time to work on stuff. I'm at the hotel. You know, when I'm home, I'm like, I'm always on the go, so I don't even feel like I engage nearly as much mm -hmm. uh, or even have as much time as I wish I did have for it. Um, but, yeah, the Empress of the Lanes was something I think that was just a great opportunity for all of us. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the exposure of, of women's bowling, uh, you know, and being able to throw – I mean, it was really cool for me because, like, you know, the, the last time I was on a TV show was when I was a kid, so was, people haven't seen me on TV, and it was kind of cool to know that, you know, I was there and, you know, bring more awareness of, hey, I'm a bowler too. Mm -hmm. it, even though I do strongly believe that, um, you know, when you make a TV show, like at our events, it's, you know, you have to earn it. You have to belong there too. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that's a, it's very important as well. Mm -hmm. um, so... Yeah, I think that it was great, and I think that PBA really did a great job of marketing and creating an aspect of, like, throwing a lot of money into the program. Um, 
pretty sure Daria probably she didn't win, but she probably made the most money out of everybody. Yeah. <laughs> because of yeah, I, I just because of how everything worked. I'm not even sure I want to say something like that, but yeah, it just it was really cool because they they did they did put a lot of money into the program mm-hmm. and. It, you know, it was it was a lot of fun. They had a lot of um, what uh, I can't think of what the term is. I'm thinking of, but uh, just uh, incentives, like okay, oh, it's an yeah. to win the match, and mm-hmm. um, yeah, they did they did a lot with all of that. Um, oh. I yeah, I had, I had I had no well, idea. I think it was really cool what they did with the beer. You know, like hey, we're taking out six strikes now. That was fun. I mean, I think that we wanted to strike as much as the audience wanted us to, just so that we can go like ring the bell and be able to pop open a can of beer. <laughs> um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. That, like, it's at the very least, it's different, right? Like, it's maybe yeah. maybe it's not the the best or most correct answer, but it is something different. And I think it yeah. it add in that environment. I think it probably added an element that was more of a positive than a negative. Because if you do that at like, you know, if you do that at the Queen's show where there's you know professional stipends for like crowd engagement or like doing something yeah. rowdy, it's like well. They used to literally find Pete Weber for doing the exact same thing. <laughs> so I don't know if that's maybe the correct answer for that setting, um, yeah. but it is different. So you gotta get... when you think about other sports, I mean, you have crowds that are constantly engaging. You have, mm-hmm. um, when you think about hockey, football, basketball, the, the audience is always loud. Mm-hmm. They never stop cheering. Mm-hmm. They're always rooting for you, booing against you. And in our sport, it's like, oh, if you move even an inch don't don't you do that you know and (laughs) in my opinion as athletes are are we supposed to be prepared like i mean i get it it, it's distracting but Mm -hmm. mentally aren't we supposed to be strong enough to be able to stay focused and and not let that get to us and even if you did you step off like i don't think it's necessary to call somebody out on it right like that's my opinion um but you know but the way that they did it too at our event which a lot of people don't realize it's not like any of the noise caught you by surprise. So it wasn't like they were silent and then all of a sudden back you're swinging, everybody starts screaming. It's mm-hmm. like they started off screaming from the beginning and it was just a very, uh, it was the, the amount of noise that was there was constant. It was yeah. never going up and down, up and down. So and most of the time, like I feel like other sports, like the, the noise is always very constant as well. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it's not like it's really mentally messing with you because it's something that's a constant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like, um, cause that environment has been compared to, um, it's whole 16 at Scottsdale where it's just a party the whole time. Yeah. So I don't know if you know much about golf, but like, yeah, I, I agree. That's more energy. It makes it more fun to watch, like from a viewer's I perspective. To that too. I yeah. mean, being able to like strike and be able to run to the audience and be able to like really yeah. engage in it, you know, that, that's fun too. Yeah. Um, you brought it up. And I'm just curious, are you a Lightning fan? Absolutely. Yeah. And are you a Bucks I'm, fan then too? Mm, mm. No. Jags? Nope. Just not a football fan? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I, I will root for, I'll root for my team. Like, I'll root for Bucks if they're in it. Yeah. Um, I will root for the Cowboys and the Panthers because my dad likes Cowboys. My fiance likes Panthers. So. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, it's just... I like I like hockey a lot. Um, I'm also an Islanders fan, but that's because I'm from New York. Um, oh, okay. Baseball, I'm not super into baseball, but my mom loves the Yankees, so I'm like a Yankee fan by default. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, did you I, to go? I, if there was anything from hockey, if you're a big hockey fan, that you could put into bowling, what would you do? What would you take from hockey and install into the sport of bowling besides full contact? <laughs> <laughs> Um, hmm, that's a good question. I think a big I, thing for I, me. I, I think I like oh, all the ahead. stuff that they do in between games, but I don't even know if that would be possible to do in bowling. Like when they go to the audience, they share like little tidbits, like or it's kids cam, whatever it is. Mm. Like mm-hmm. they do a lot of fun stuff for the audience. They do like a lot of giveaways. And um, behind the scene, I mean, I, I'm not sure we did it so much with. I remember PBA used to do that. They in between they used to do like a lot of fun stuff. They used to throw t-shirts to the crowd and stuff. I think that's fun because you know now people are more motivated. Like they want to be there because it's, it's without them just sitting there watching. It's like that now they're engaging with everybody, mm-hmm. um, which I think that that that's really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
I also, the reason why I'm a huge Lightning fan and, and hockey fan to begin with is because my brother actually, I grew up watching my brother play hockey. Okay. And my brother actually got drafted to, to play for the, the Lightning twice. Um, and he got, somebody ended up running a, a red light and hit him and then tore his ACL. So that was the end of his career. But he had, I mean, it would have been really cool if I could have watched my brother play for the Lightning. Yeah. 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 That's a, that's, yeah, that's, that sucks that that happened, but it's cool that he was right there too. Um, no, that's, that's awesome. Um, I guess to wrap things up, cause I have taken a whole lot of your morning here. Um, I guess to, if this, this is one way that I've liked to like cap off podcasts in the past is if there was Anything that you could share with the world, like a thought, a theory, an idea, just a piece of advice, um, anything, one thing that you could share with the world, what what would that thing be? Don't limit yourself to other people's beliefs. Uh, I think that everybody's going to have an opinion of you, whether it's positive or negative. And if you listen to them, and that fact that they don't believe that you can be successful or be a professional or whatever... You don't listen to them. Just try to be the best that you can be and try to live your own dreams. Work towards it. Be, work hard. Um, I really, I one day, you know, one day I really hope that I could be somebody that people can look to or say, hey, just look how hard she worked and look, she made it, you know, because she never gave up. I, I want to be that inspiration for me. Yeah. I may not be that person who came out where my first season went. That maybe that person who never gave up and has always worked hard to accomplish my dream because that is ultimately my goal. That's the most important thing to me right now. Yeah. So that's that's how I would like to share with you. I would like others to see me and I really would like them to really believe in themselves and not and hold themselves accountable for a lot higher than what other people would and not listen to them. Yeah. There's too many bad opinions out there. It's just, they're not true. They're really not. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. And um, I tell you what, I think that the day that you cross that that plane of getting getting that first W, I think that there will be a lot of people that will have that um, that will share that sentiment with you because um, that is one thing that's uh, there's 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 absolutely the um, <laughs> the value of the instant success story. You know, they pop out of college and they're just they're just champs and all that sort of stuff, which yeah. that has its thing. But also, um, I think that there is so much to be said about somebody like yourself that is just you're working to the point that you're going to get there. And I just want to as much as I can encourage it, because I think that what you're doing is really cool. Um, I think that you are right there. <laughs> um because you, feels like it's, that far away. it's a big. That's a. That's such a big gap, though, right? And and um, I think that's, you know. Sorry. No, you're good. You're good. I, I. It's it's a hard thing to kind of quantify for me because I'm I'm trying to be encouraging to somebody that I look up to, which is very strange. Um, <laughs> but I uh, I think that if they're you know you you like you said you you're working on your little stuff, but just just hang just hang it in there because you're right there like you know you have the game. You know that you have the physical game to get there. And I'm really excited now to know that you like Reno to watch that fall classic because now my hopes are through the roof for you. Um, and, and I think that's, you can, I think that it'll be a good event for you. And I think that if you believe it will be, that it will be. So um, I am going to let you go though. Cause I could continue to talk to you about bowling and yourself. And I'm so curious, like what your favorite ball in your bag is right now, but I'm not going to ask. We're going to save that maybe for next time. Okay. Um, but it's probably gonna be your favorite ball anyway, so. what was that? Exactly. Um, but thank I can't live without my black widow 2.0. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> 
Um, but thank you very much, Ashley. I really appreciate it. Um, I look forward to having everybody check this out because like I said, I think you're, you have a story that is really worthwhile and is interesting and I'm excited to get this out there. So thank you very much for doing this. Um, I, 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 I'm really thankful for it and, uh, best of luck if I don't talk to you before Reno and with everything that you bowl in between and even with what you got going on with coaching and all that sort of stuff too. Um, I wish you the best of luck with all that. And uh, thank you very much for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good day. Yeah, thank you too. guys. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you liked this episode, please be sure to hit subscribe, hit that like button, drop a comment to let me know what you thought or maybe who you'd like to see on the next 10 Pin Life podcast. But that's going to be all for this one. And don't forget, your best life is a 10 Pin Life. See ya.